pipes, easily one of the most ubiquitous things that we use when we're bringing multiple commands together on a Unix style system like FreeBSD, macOS, or Linux. Now, we've all done this, we run some type of command like curl and we get output from it. And then we realize, ah, you know, I wanna do something or manipulate that output to some degree. So we introduce the pipe character and then send it to an application like JQ, which while it can access multiple fields, we often just use it to pretty print the output and get us a little bit of an easier way to look through things. And JQ again is putting out output through standard out in this case. So we can pipe that into some tool like less, and then we can use less to actually scroll through the output that we get. So this is a pretty common practice. I'm sure you've likely done it before, but the thing that I want to explore today is a little bit behind the scenes of these pipe characters and specifically what they're doing. And also what if we wanted to persist this idea? Right? So what if we didn't just want in this one array of commands to pipe everything through, but maybe actually make almost a queue that we could listen in and provide some form of inner process communication on a given system. So let's go ahead and dig into that today. Starting off, let's look at what a world might look like without this pipe construct. We can, can, we can conceive that there would be a similar effect if we were to just output to some form of JSON file and then from that JSON file, run these similar commands where we, in the case of JQ, give it an argument that is that file. We then overwrite the file's content, and then we can just call less against that same file. And once all is done, we can do some amount of cleanup of that file as well. Now, obviously pipes are giving us a huge convenience factor so that we don't have to deal with this every single time. And if we take a quick look at what a pipe is from a kind of Unixy Linux standpoint, well, these pipe characters are effectively buffers where that standard output Output that's coming out of each command is ending up buffered by the Linux kernel. In fact, there is a syscall called pipe, and you'll see the file descriptor that gets returned and how it kind of pulls some amount of buffering in and out. And then that can act as standard in for another application that we pipe to. So it is effectively negating the need for us to do all of these different files each time we're moving between applications, which is a huge convenience. With a quick look inside of the Linux kernel, we can actually infer some details about pipes. So if we look, or in this case, search for the pipe C file, which is going to be under FS, inside of here, we can get some good details about how pipes are buffers. We also can understand some of the things that we can do, such as what the max size of a pipe buffer would be, along with some details about where we can go in to actually change the size of a pipe buffer. Very uncommon thing to do, but just kind of cool in the weeds details that we can discern from here. And there is a note up here talking a little bit about head and tails. If you've ever implemented like a ring buffer or a, you know, a circular array, I guess, in a way where it can kind of overwrite as a buffer, that's effectively what we've got going on under under the hood here. And if we just look at the syscall definition, we can see that it's taking in the pipe and it's also giving back a file descriptor as well, or taking a file descriptor rather. So there's kind of just these cool mechanisms happening to present as if there's a file descriptor, but it again being buffered under the hood so that we don't have to worry about the overhead of a physical, or I guess not physical, but a technical file. Instead, it's all buffered by the kernel. Now we have to look at the question of how do we ensure that our applications end up interoperable with the larger Unix landscape of applications like we saw with curl, jq, and less. And as we saw, to make them interoperable, a really good way to do that would be to ensure that we can accept input on standard in from a pipe. So what we'll do now is take a look at building a small application, in this case in Go, but the principles will apply similarly, called JSON check. Now I'll show you kind of what the end state of JSON check is going to look like. In this case, I have JSON check fully compiled, but we'll go into the code shortly. And JSON check should be able to accept a JSON file. In this case, I have products.json, and I happen to know that products.json is in fact a valid JSON file. It'll also print out the timestamp, and we'll see why a bit later. Now, if we give JSON check something through a pipe, I'm 
also expecting it to work just fine. So let's go back to our curl here. And in the curl, I want to be able to pipe to JSON check and be able to validate that it is good JSON. And because it's interoperable with a variety of tools, this of course should work if we were to do something like echo. So if we echoed some improper JSON intentionally, this is not right, we'd expect the same thing to happen. Of course, this time it's going to report that it is in fact invalid JSON rather than valid JSON. So this little tool that's been built is interoperable. And let's take a look in the source code as to how we can ensure we can accept these piped inputs. Now we're inside the source code and we'll start off by just looking at the constants at the top. The constants are obviously just the messages that we'll be returning back to the client. And our focus right now is going to be all contained inside of mains. This is a really simple tool and it's just gonna operate inside of the main function. All right, now that we're inside of main, we are starting off by just capturing a byte array that is going to hold the JSON data once we capture it. And out of the gate, we're not just going to read from the file because what we want to do in the order of operations is to see if there is input from a pipe that we would like to use. If so, use it. Otherwise, read from an argument in a file. And, and I should warn you, the source code is doing a lot of things like omitting errors and things that you wouldn't normally do. But for brevity and keeping it simple, I'm going to kind of push some of that stuff aside. First thing we do is we get the stat from the file, and this is going to give us some information about a particular file. Now, what we're statting, as you'll notice, is the descriptor effectively for standard in. So it might feel a little weird treating standard in as a file, but like that's effectively what it is. There's just a descriptor we can grab. There's some information about it we can get. And by getting this information, we're gonna be able to understand whether it's a pipe. To understand whether it's a pipe, we can actually look at the comments here, but also this if conditional, okay? So the first thing we do is we look for the file mode. Now, the zero is what we're expecting for both of these here, okay? And for file mode, luckily, uh, zero just references that it's a directory. So if we go into mode, into file mode, these are the different options we've got for file modes. And you'll notice in this const that zero references that it is a directory, which is what a pipe will act like under the hood. Then on top of that, we're looking for the character device. Now, pipes are going to be character devices. So when we see that it is a Unix character device, we can discern it's a directory, it's also a character device, and thus for all intents and purposes here, it is a pipe. So now that we know that this is a pipe, we just read the standard input. And in our case, just using read all, which will grab that and return it as a byte array, is a really easy way for us to just store that inside of our JSON data byte array. Now in the else condition, this would be when there was not a pipe, we are going to still handle the file use case and eventually when we talk about it, the named pipe. So in the file use case, we can simply use os.open. We're assuming that there is an argument passed in and this will index out of bounds if not, because again, we're keeping it simple. We're gonna defer the close of the file after the fact and we're gonna set up a buffered IO reader against that file file descriptor. Now what we do here to handle both files and a potentially named pipe is that we just go through and we read every single line and for every single line that we read, we are going to get back a byte array representing that line. Since JSON data is in fact a byte array, what we can do here is just append to the JSON data byte array, whatever that line is. So we're just continuing to build it up and build it up and build it up. And finally, if there is an error, which we should be smarter about this, but what we're gonna look for here is a end of file error, an IO EOF, right? If it's an end, an end of file error, we're just going to break break out of the loop because we've hit the end of that content. Now you can kind of see that we've basically got two cases here that work. We've got the file case, which will load the JSON data byte array. And then we've got the piped case, which will also load that JSON data byte array. Coming down to the bottom, we finish out our logic by just doing the validation. Lucky for us, the JSON package has a JSON.valid call we can make. We can give it our byte array and it will return true or false whether that JSON is valid. Based on that, we will return a message, either valid or invalid, and then give a status code back as well, another kind of best practice 
So if we return zero, it's considered a successful exit, and then non-zero would be considered an error exit. And these numbers are a bit arbitrary. We'll talk about that a different day, but suffice to say, we're kind of following best practices with this model. So now we've got our main set up and we've got the JSON data ready to go. Now we can easily build this and what we can do is do a go build, specify the output flag and we'll just call it JSON check so that it's a little bit clean for us to call. Once JSON check has been built, now we should be able to send our curl command into it. So let's try exactly that. We'll do the curl command and the curl command will go into JSON check. Now we've got our input, no problem at all. And just like you saw before, we can do the different variances. We can do the file name. We can do a echo command with bad JSON inside of it. This will all be parsed and give us the appropriate response. Now we're going to wrap up on the concept of named pipes. And named pipes are quite similar to what we were talking about before. They're often referred to as FIFO queues. They facilitate inter-process communication. The big difference is that we are going to be using a command make FIFO. And on most Unix-based distributions, if not all, you should be able to find make FIFO. You're going to find it on an Apple computer or, or Mac. You're going to find it on FreeBSD. You'll find it on Linux and so on. And make FIFO is just going to create a first in first out queue, essentially. And this will basically be like a pipe that's referenced as a file. So when we call make FIFO temp JSON buffer, so let's go ahead and do that now. We'll do make FIFO and I'm just going to put it in the temp directory. It doesn't have to be there for the sake of kind of cleaning it up after the fact. And we're going to call it Q in this case. So now if I go to TMP and just check out Q, so Q, there it is. We've got this Q. We can see that it is a little bit of an interesting file, right? We can see the P at the beginning here. So this is almost like a named or persistent pipe for us. Now, what we'll do is actually utilize our same JSON buffer application that we built to kind of loop and keep watching this as different applications send JSON data in, we're going to have our JSON check print out both the timestamp and whether that JSON was valid, kind of showing off how this name pipe can be really cool for longer running process communication. Let's try it. So I will actually just maybe copy this and we will paste in this loop. So this is basically a bash while loop. And what we're doing in this bash loop is we are going to be doing JSON check against, and let's make sure we set it to our Q name, which was just Q, right? And it will just sit here and wait because it is again looking for that file. It's got the descriptor open and it's looking to read until it gets to end of file. So while we've got this here, we'll open up another tmux buffer. So let's do that now. All right, great. And then we can just send stuff in and effectively see what the output from JSON check is up here. So let's start off by doing something bad. So we'll do an echo and we'll say not right, just some kind of random characters that clearly are not JSON. And then just like we would a file, we can just send something in here. So let's go ahead and send to tmpq this sends it in it puts it in the queue echo pops back and we can see i'm just going to minimize a little bit here to make it on one line we can see that this is considered invalid json that was received and we just continue this pattern right if we go back to our curl request now let's put the curl request inside of the queue as well so we'll send that in just like this and in this case we put it in the queue it responded back with JSON check, and it'll just keep going and going and going until JSON check is no longer watching this queue. And if it's not, we'll just see stuff kind of hang up here. So, you know, we'll do uh, maybe, you know, kill this at the top. So JSON queue is no longer listening. Then at the bottom, we'll do this request again. And now it's just blocked, right? It's just sitting here, putting it on the queue, but not getting anything that's kind of popping back from the queue to release it more or less. But once again, if we did this, in fact, we don't even have to do the, uh, the loop, I guess, in this case, we could just do JSON check and we'll make sure that JSON check is getting the file TMP queue, hit enter. JSON check receives it off the queue, which thus relieves curl at the bottom here. And since a named pipe is effectively a file, the way that we've set up the read here is that we could just read in a file as well. So JSON check could also grab this product's JSON file and effectively do the same thing. 
So that is it for pipes. You've now seen make you've seen make FIFO for named pipes. You've seen normal pipes for just moving information to and from and kind of getting an idea of some of the internals, which I find cool. And if you leave with this talk with kind of anything, what I hope is that maybe you've got a little bit more respect and appreciation for what's going on with pipes. They're really cool. I know I take them for granted all the time, but also if you're writing a tool or a script in the future, you may want to consider the idea of accepting standard input through pipes because then your tool set will largely become interoperable with the larger landscape of Unix-based tools.